So we're talking about designing your life worth living, right? How many of you think your life's like interesting to you? Your life kind of like matters to you? Okay, yeah. So that's what we're talking about. Now, so we're coming from a couple of different points of view. So first of all, sure enough, I am the co-founder of the Stanford Life Design Lab, the D-Life Lab. In the design school, we love to put a D in front of things and call it designy. Um, and so, you know, we, we teach courses and we develop material and now we actually teach other universities how to do the kind of things that we're doing. And then over time, we wrote this book that Megan mentioned, which is now like all over the place, 600,000 copies, 23 different languages. Um, actually, the second book, Designing Your Work Life, is actually on pre-sale now, shipping in a couple of weeks. So we're doing this book thing, and then here come these Veritas people say, hey, come down to Cal Poly and talk to these people. So we're really, the question comes up right off the bat, <clears throat> um, you know, this designing your life worth living, this is like the big question, uh, but against that big question, so where are you coming from? I mean, who is this guy? You know, so are we getting the Stanford design education guy? Are we getting the Silicon Valley startup guy? Are we getting like the popular book guy? You know, are we getting like the Christianly approved talk to large groups of people guy? Um, so, because <clears throat> you've got to know where these people are coming from, right? So here's the thing. So the Veritas people, so, you know, they, they think Jesus rocks the house. Um, and accordingly, uh, we would like to not so much, you know, proselytize at you or what have you, but facilitate thoughtful conversations on questions of importance. Because if we want to be thoughtful people living meaningful lives, you know, they're asking the same big questions that people have been asking since, since the beginning of consciousness, you know, and the ability to think. Um, it turns out if you're a person of faith, actually in any wisdom tradition, certainly Christianity would be included here, um, then hopefully you have a core competency in what we in the design school, design school would call life and vocational wayfinding. You know, that we're trying to help have a core competency in life and vocational wayfinding, i.e. this figure it out thing. Turns out life is actually an improv skit. You are just making it up as you go. But you can get good at making it up as you go. So faith traditions claim to be good at making it up as you go or learning how to discern your way forward. So the reason Veritas wants to host the conversation is because that's something we care about. Now, tonight, this is not an, an explicitly Christian presentation per se. It's not an explicitly unchristian one. My partner at Stanford, Bill Burnett, is a Nietzsche-loving atheist. I'm a Jesus-revering person trying to live in a faithful world. You know, and we agree on most everything we do together. This is an inclusive conversation. Why is it an inclusive conversation? By the way, am I talking too fast for you? No, good. I'm not going to slow down. I just wanted to know. Um, <clears throat> we haven't got much time. The, um, because... The, uh, the current moniker of design, uh, of design thinking, we talk, talk about design thinking, we have the D school at Stanford, we teach this stuff all the time. That's actually the new name, about a dozen, 15 years old, for a thing that's about 60 years old called human-centered design, HCD. Anybody working on HCI stuff or human-computer interface stuff, UX, UI? Okay, all that stuff is downstream of what was originally HCD, human-centered design. Human-centered design is human in two ways, not just one, but 90% of the time, 90% of the people get it 50% right, which is we think human-centered means ergonomic, is good for the human user, it's about that for sure, but it's also about how do human designers design, how do we work together, how does collaboration occur, how do we think, how do we ideate? So I want to humanly design things that humans can humanly use. That's like way human is what we're trying to go for here. Um, and it turns out that <clears throat> If Jesus were here, he would say, look, uh, I would argue that the fundamental invitation of the Christian faith is to become fully human. So we're really on the same page here. If you get the human thing right, you can't go wrong, which is why design thinking and Christianity get along just fine. You know, and I happen to teach them both, and so I can speak out of either side of my mouth tonight without having any hypocrisy problems. Um, so that's, that's the whole sort of where are these people coming from. I do ascribe to the faith that was the motivation for Veritas to do this thing, but this isn't a Bible class. This is a question being looked at from a very broad human point of view about what does it mean to design a life worth living? Okay, so that's where we're coming from. So what does it mean to design a life worth living? What's that all about? Well, <clears throat> you know, that brings up the question, what is my purpose? I want my life to matter. I want my life to be worth living, but I have to figure out my purpose so that I can direct my life accordingly, right? Doesn't that make sense? Now, maybe that's not necessarily the killer word that you, maybe that's not the primary word you had in mind, but it's really, I need, I need to figure it out. Maybe it's my passion. What's my passion? Or what's my calling? Or what's my meaning-making thing? What's, what means something to me? You know, what's, what's my superpower? That's post-Marvel movies. That's what we want to ask now. What's my superpower? You know, or what is my vocation? That's kind of an old word. What, imp, what mission am I on? What impact do I want to have in the world? You know, these are the kind of words that come up when we talk about this stuff. 
And there's a whole bunch of words <clears throat> in addition to purpose. So now the first thing I want to do is help you dial into where you're coming from. I told you where I was coming from. Now, where are you coming from? Which of these words, or the one that you know I should have put up there but I skipped, is the one that actually most animates you? If we were going to help you by the time you walked out the door tonight, be better at understanding what it means for you to live a life worth living, what's that mostly about on that slide? I'm really looking for my mission. I'm really, I want it to be meaningful. It's all about impact. Turn to your neighbor and share your favorite word and why. Ding, your conversation's over. Okay, now I just want you to check in because first of all, you know, aim at nothing bound to hit it, um, but aim at something you got a shot. I mean, what is it we're really after here? I want you to be thinking about, am I making progress tonight? Now, going back to all these words, I am going to, for the purpose of the conversation tonight, try to zero in on the purpose word. I'm going to talk about purpose a little bit. Now, there's a problem with purpose. By the way, how many think I know my purpose? I would like to know my purpose. Good. Okay. <clears throat> You're in the right room. We'll see if we can help. Now, here's the problem with purpose. You know, I'm trying to find my purpose. I'm running around, not trying to fall in the holes on the silly graphic. And um, so my friend, Bill Damon... Uh, at Stanford, who runs the Center for Adolescence. He runs the Center for Adolescence at Stanford. He's a worldwide recognized person in uh, young adult formation, particularly focusing on the question of purpose. So his book, The Path to Purpose, is one of the more regarded things on the science of purpose navigation. Uh, now, by the way, since he studies adolescence, does that apply to you? Um, up to what age do you think Bill studies people because he studies adolescence? 27, that's right. Um, why? Because your neocortex isn't even formed until you're 27 years old, a little later in men. Oh, what a surprise. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, so Bill go goes out and tries to orient himself to how are people relating to purpose and how purposeful, if you will, how are people becoming. And with no pre-wired orientation, he finds that people fall into four categories and they're roughly, particularly young adults, fall in four categories, roughly the same size, and they are these. Number one, there are the disengaged. About 25% of people are disengaged. They're disengaged on the question of purpose for a variety of reasons. They're just distracted. Now, thinking about it, they're disillusioned. They tried and they failed, and I'm giving up. You know, the world is not my friend. Or they're dysfunctional. You know, I mean, you've got to get off that meth thing. You've got to stop being mad at your mom before we can even have the conversation. There's something going on in the way. So a lot of ways to be disengaged. One in four people are disengaged. Then we have the dabblers, 31%. Dabblers and the next category, the dreamers. We've got dabblers and dreamers. Uh, dabblers are people who are, I'll try a little this, I'll try a little that. You know, <clears throat> I think, no, maybe not that, maybe this other thing. You know, they keep trying things out and they sort of never get there. And they're dabbling, 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 never really able to connect with anything in particular. The dreamer, very different, really cares, real climate change. It is about climate change, you know, and they're so committed, they are not gonna sell out. You know, they're waiting for the right thing. You know, so they're still pulling lattes on the swing shift at Starbucks, you know, waiting for the right climate change opportunity. But their dreaming, you know, is keeping them from engaging because they, they won't compromise. We used to say they're, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Here's the deal. I don't think in history there has ever been a time when there are more things to distract you that can get you disengaged when it is easier to be a dabbler, it's called the gig economy now, we can't fix it, we featured it. Um, so it turns out, you know, doing lots of different things at the same time. Multitasking is now a feature, not a bug. So it's really easy to be a dabbler. How many of you have a minor? Whoa. Who's got two? Who's doing a fifth year? Okay, yeah, so, you know, <clears throat> who's, I mean, if 80, Bill is pretty convinced 80% of master's degrees are just an unwillingness to graduate. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a form of dabbling at great expense. Um, you know, <clears throat> so it's really easy to dabble right now. And if you want to be a dreamer, we have a terrific set of global issues around which to connect yourself to a dreaming concern. And whether it's income inequality or racism or gender fairness and justice or whether, you know, it's climate change, there are some really upsetting things going on right now worldwide populist polarization, um, and, and you could really get committed to those things. And so the risk of being disengaged, dabbling, or dreaming has never been greater. And even awakening to one of those things late in the day can be kind of terrifying. And only about 20%, this was about 10 years ago, were well-directed, had figured out a direction they wanted to go, were able to navigate the compromise of making a, the real decision of doing a real thing in real time. It's not perfect, it's not a dreamer job, but it's on the way to get somewhere. And 
what we don't want to do, of course, is I think we want to be the directed people. We don't want to get stuck in one of these other holes. Okay, so that's what I want. How do you get there? Back to what is my purpose? I want to be one of these purposeful directed people. What is my purpose? I got to answer that question, right? Actually, I think wrong. <clears throat> I'm going to give you three reasons why that's the wrong question. Three reasons why what's my purpose trying to solve that problem is a bad problem. In design, we talk about problem finding before problem solving. That's what the empathy step is all about. And frankly, most of the time things don't work, it's because you're working on the wrong thing. So first thing up, why is this the wrong question, Dave? Well, according to my buddy um, George Valiant, that's kind of George Valiant, um, who was the last and the longest running project manager of the grant study. The grants, anybody heard of the grant study? Any psych majors? Um, <clears throat> the grant study was a long running behavioral study, started in 1936. It's not referenced often enough because it's a profoundly undiverse study. 236 white male sophomores at Harvard College. Let's study them. How representative. Um, <laughs> oh, and they did a working class, mostly white construction worker study at the same time to balance the study out. So, now, for the purposes of our conversations, and I will argue that that astonishing lack of diversity actually empowers the particular takeaway we're going to look for. So we're going to drop in briefly on a, on a short video that's hopefully loud enough to hear. Um, it's bad graininess, but you can hear George talking about. So finally, once everybody died. By the way, interesting people were in this thing, including John F. Kennedy, the president, and, and William Bradley, the head of the Washington Post, when Watergate came out, and a bunch of people you never heard of. Um, <clears throat> and he talked about what did we learn watching these men over a 50, 60 year period of time at different stages of their life. And he's chatting about you. He's chatting about the young adult phase and he has some interesting things to say. I mean, the, the take home lesson is always to enjoy where you are A little louder, now. folks. It's all right that young people can do the things that they can do. I mean, the youth that the old Envy is accompanied by the miserable process of getting from 25 to 35, where you've got all this health and all this youth, and you're scared stiff that when it's all said and done, you're not going to amount to a hill of beans. And if you just wait, virtually all the men, by the time they were 45 or 50, uh, amounted to something. Knowing that is, is such relief, and you just don't know it at 30. Okay, thanks, George. I mean, so, you know, the miserable process of getting from 25 to 35. Isn't that encouraging? Um, <clears throat> and because, why? Because you're scared stiff that life is not really going to work out. You know, but if you just wait, I mean, all of them are by 45 or 55, and most of you, I'm sure, are thrilled to wait 30 years until life makes sense. Um, you know, it all kind of works out, and that's such a relief. You just don't know it at 30, and most of you are somewhere on the order of a decade away from that. So good luck. We'll just see you later. Um, here is the point. Now, first of all, think, who are these guys? You're the sophomore class of 1936. How old are you when you're a sophomore or second year? You're, you're 19. Okay, so what's going on around 1936 or a little after that? Think of World War II, right? So you're 25 years older in World War II. What do you do? You go to the war. So, you know, only the guys that survived the war stayed in the study. So who are these guys? White, male, World War II veteran, Harvard graduates, working in the 1950s, coming out of the war era, during the greatest expansion of capitalism on the face of the earth, making the world safe for democracy and capitalism. Now, do you think these are the guys, and they're all guys, white guys, you know, who <clears throat> would say, gosh, you know, I'm so upset. My boss won't let me bring my yoga mat to work. <laughs> I just don't think he really gets me. I don't think so. I think these guys are kicking butt and taking names and making the world safe for democracy and succeeding. And yet, even those kind of guys, these greatest generation men, behind the closed door with the people, the white coats and the clipboards, when they're asked the honest question, how's it going, they're scared stiff. Is this really what I had in mind? Is this really the life I meant to live? If they're feeling it, maybe we would too. I'm a little tip to the religious story, you know. And Moses, when he was about 40 years old, 
took it into his mind to go down to visit the children of Israel. He was the chief of staff to Pharaoh at the time, undercover. That was a long time ago. Moses started thinking about, well, who do I really want to be in his 40s? Right? Jesus is a mama's boy. He doesn't even leave home until he's 31. I mean, come on. It takes a long time to make a Messiah, apparently. So here, look. <clears throat> so this has been going on for some time. Now, reason number two, this is a lousy question, like, which one, which life should it be? Which purpose maybe should it be? So we have to ask an important question here, which is how many lives are you? This is what we're going to do. This is a scientifically minded university. So we're going to do a Gedanken experiment. Who knows what that is? Somebody here should know. What is it? A thought experiment. Gedanken is German for thinking. Uh, so we're going to think an experiment. These are very important in the history of science. Without Gedanken experiments, we wouldn't have the theory of relativity. Einstein did them all the time. Without them, we wouldn't have the Hubble telescope. You know, that's kind of stuff. So it's stuff we can do in our head because the conditions on Earth don't work or the science isn't available yet, but we could imagine our way into it. We're going to do one of these right now. Here are the conditions of your Gedanken experiment. Assume with me, if you will, number one, the multiverse is true. There are infinite parallel universes, but angstroms apart if we knew how to measure in the 19th dimension. Just assume with me that that is true. Thing one. Thing two. Thing two. String theory is correct. We actually now have access to it so we can run wormhole management systems where you actually can obtain concurrent consciousness across the veils of the, the multiverse universes, i.e., you can be as many people as you want and aware of all of your parallel selves. How cool is that? But there's this one, number three, thing about the multiverse that's kind of weird. The multiverse abhors a vacuum, a wasted space of consciousness. So you can have a life in as many universes as you want, but not more than you will actually use. It doesn't want you to waste lives. So the question is, how many lives are you? See, one thing Bill and I have noticed in our work is that all of us contain more aliveness than one lifetime will permit you to live out, i.e., there's more than one of you in there. Now the question is, how many? How many you got? Imagine you could live as many lives as you wanted to. You could be as many versions of you as you wanted. You could even take the ones you really like and repeat them. Like my daughter, Lisa, first time at Disneyland, age of eight, thought a really interesting way to spend seven and a half hours was write Dumbo 42 times in a row. You want to do 42 Dumbo lives? Go for it. That's fine. You can have all you want, just don't waste them. So I want you to be thinking of a number right now. How many lives, how many alivenesses worth of living are you? If they're free, just don't waste them. I'm going to go one, two, three. When I would have said four, you shout out your number nice and loud. I don't want to hear what this group thinks about how many lives you are. Okay, get your number. I am how many slots in the multiverse? You're ready. One, two, three. I heard 3,000. I didn't. I very often I'll hear one, usually in the back of the room. One! I'm committed to the one life I have. I'm not asking for more. And if there are any ones in the room, I get that. That's an ideological position. Bless you for that, but that's okay. Now, so I heard 1,000 right over here. Here's the interesting thing. By the way, I lied. That's a complete lie. You only get one. Um, but back to the purpose question. If there's more than one lifetime's worth of you in there, might there be more than one purpose for you? And could that change over time? How many of you are hoping that when you leave this place 20 years from now, you are doing something we can't even talk about today because it doesn't exist yet? Who wants that life? Okay, about a third of you. How do you plan for that? How are you supposed to discern right now the purpose of the thing that doesn't even exist yet? Right? You've got to be thinking about these relationships with this purpose question. Okay, reason three, this is the wrong question. It's the wrong metaphor. That's a guy named Alan Watts. Alan Watts is no longer with us, been gone a long time, but one of the first guys in the West to bring Eastern thinking to the West. And he said a lot of very interesting things. And he particularly talked about education and life goals that we're preparing young people for, i.e. you. And, uh, and of course, because they're so philosophically minded, the guys at South Park decided that they should illustrate this talk. Um, so the South Park guys illustrated a little talk by Alan Watts, which I'm now going to let you listen into, and we'll see if this sounds resonant to anybody in the room. In music, one doesn't make the end of a composition the point of the composition. 
If that were so, the best conductors would be those who played faster. And there would be composers who wrote only finales. <laughs> People go to the conference just to hear one crashing chord. So that's the end. <laughs> but we don't see that as uh, something brought by our education into our everyday conduct. We've got a system of schooling which gives a completely different impression. It's all graded. And what we do is we put the child into the corridor of this grade system with a kind of, come on, kitty, kitty, kitty. And yeah, you go to kindergarten, you know. And that's a great thing because when you finish that, you'll get into first grade. And then, come on, first grade leads to second grade, and so on, and then you get out of grade school, you've got high school, and it's revving up, the thing is coming, then you're going to go to college, and by Jove, then you get into graduate school, and when you're through with graduate school, you go out to join the world. And then you get into some racket where you're selling insurance, and they've got that quota to make, and you're going to make that, and all the time, the thing is coming. It's coming, it's coming, that great thing, the, the success you're working for. Then when you wake up one day about 40 years old, you say, my God, I've arrived. <laughs> I'm there. And you don't feel very different from what you always felt. And there's a slight letdown because you feel there's a hoax. And there was a hoax, a dreadful hoax. They made you miss everything. And we thought of life by analogy with a journey, with a pilgrimage which had a serious purpose at the end, and the thing was to get to that end, success or whatever it is, or maybe heaven after you're dead. But we missed the point the whole way along. It was a musical thing, and you were supposed to sing or to dance while the music was being played. Everybody here ever take an advanced class? You know, get into the honors group. Um, here, kitty, kitty, you can get into Cal Poly. Um, <clears throat> if you major in the right thing. Now here's the thing, you talked about the destination versus the journey. There's a classic uh, situation, is it the journey? That, no, 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 it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. The journey is the destination. You just heard that, the journey is the destination. Yeah, it must be, must be present to win, all that really cool kind of stuff. Um, here's the problem, that's not what he said. I mean, you may think the journey is the destination, that's fine, I'm not here to argue with you, but what Alan was saying was not that the journey is the destination. Because even then, if the point of the journey is rationalized by virtue of the quality or the nobility of its destination, you're just supposed to pay attention along the way, you're still missing it. He's saying, it's no, it's not the journey versus the destination, it's the journey versus the dance. Is Are you joining the dance? It's actually about the participative experience, not the purposeful end per se. That's a different metaphor. Now, is that the right one or not? Well, yeah, that's up to you to decide. We're going to get to that. But so, what I'm going to suggest tonight on the question of purpose, here's what we do. We do reframes all the time in design, is um, and we talk about dysfunctional beliefs. So, the, if, anybody here actually, like, opened the book? Anybody actually, like, got the book or you know, been forced to read it by somebody? Okay. Um, so, the book's organized around a bunch of dysfunctional beliefs, you know, followed by a reframe. By the way, Jesus used to do that all the time. He'd go, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. You know, that's a reframe. Um, so, the dysfunctional belief is... I have to know my purpose in order to plan and pursue a life worth living. And I'm saying, no, you don't. In fact, it's a bad idea. The reframe is, <clears throat> I can live purposefully starting right now, and I can keep building a worthwhile life as I go along. So my shift is going to be from, it may seem a minor one grammatically, but I think operationally it's huge, so I need to know my purpose, so I'm going to live purposefully. It's a way of doing things, not a thing of doing things. Okay? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> this thing about way versus thing, that in fact actually was what Jesus was mostly talking about. So if you, you've, regardless of what your relationship with Jesus is, you've probably heard of Doubting Thomas. Yeah, well, Doubting Thomas is known for it, and put my hand in his side, I won't believe, and all that stuff. But then a conversation continues. It's interesting, regardless of what you think about the historicity of all this, it's from the part of the Gospels that include the risen Jesus, post-resurrection Jesus, talking with Thomas. So this is like the really, really important Jesus. Totally listen to him. We know he's the credible guy because like he raised from the dead, and that's a very credibilizing thing on your CV. Um, so, <clears throat> so Tom and, and Jesus had just been talking to, the, to people, and he said, and you know the way where I am going. And Thomas pops up and he goes, Lord, How do we know the way if we do not know where you're going? Now, Thomas is all of us. Thomas goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. You said, just said that you know the way. 
I don't know the way because I don't know where I'm going. I can't know the way unless I know where I'm going. It's all about the destination. And Jesus replies, I am the way. What I meant by that was this way of being in the world, this consciousness, this manner of living I'm talking about, that's it. It's about the, it's a, a kind of a personhood that I'm talking to you about. So this idea of what is my way versus what is my thing or my destination or my outcome or my goal are really different ways of being in the world. So do you want to be a knowing person or a living person? I haven't got time to get into the knowing thing. That's kind of a Greek orientation. You know, let's know stuff. And what Jesus is talking about, what I'm talking about, what design talks about, because we have a bias to action, is let's do stuff. So living purposefully is different than knowing your purpose. Okay, now the prereq, prerequisite to living purposefully, one of many, could be coherency. What do I mean by coherency? What I mean by that is connecting these three dots, who you are, what you believe, and what you do. If you can, according to the research on meaning making, which is a broad field of psychology now, in the positive psychology realm, if you can interconnect these dots, which means, of course, you have to be able to articulate them, your chance of experiencing meaning making goes way up. So if you take our class, you actually do the exercises in the book, we have some stuff to help you figure this out and work on some of these definitions on what it means <clears throat> about who am I, what I believe, and what I'm doing. Now, the question then becomes, okay, um, where do we start? I didn't get my dots. I mean, I went through new student orientation. They didn't hand me my little package of dots to connect. Where do I get these? How do we start this conversation? Well, very often when we start this conversation, we run into the classic tension, again, particularly in Western culture, between being and doing. Am I a human being or am I a human doing? Hi, what do you do? We get so tired of being treated like I'm a human doing. Hi, what are you studying? Hi, oh, what are you going to do with that? I'm majoring in anthro. You're one of the two anthro majors here at Cal Poly. Um, you know, <clears throat> and, you know, and then, of course, hey, what are you going to do with that? As though that's who you are. I'm sick of that. I'm sick of that. I'm not a, I'm not a doing. I'm a being. This is a zero-sum game. Most dichotomies are. So the reframe on this is don't get stuck in this human doing being thing. What you want to do is have what we call the generative cycle of being, doing, and becoming. See, if we're actually embodied persons, if you're actually you're an embodied intelligence, you're not a brain on a transport system, you are a human being. And you're going to grow over time. You know, and life's going to be like totally different after you're 27 and you have an entire brain working with you. You know, um, <clears throat> so you start with who you are. You got to start with the reality of who you are, and it includes who you're not. You know, I don't know if mom told you you can be anything you want to be. It's not true. You can be lots of things. One guy can be a thousand things, but you can't be anything. You know, I mean, there's like no fast twitch muscles anywhere in my gene pool. I may be tall, but I am white and I cannot jump. Um, so basketball is not in my future, um, other than on the couch. Um, and in this year with the Warriors, it's not even that's working. So, um, <clears throat> so I can be a human being, then I go do stuff. Get out in the world and do things. And if you're paying attention while you're doing things, which again is optional, change is inevitable, growth is optional. If I'm going to grow by paying attention, I'm going to be becoming. In fact, I start noticing even the things I choose to do, I can anticipate what part of my personality, what part of my personhood I'm going to be investing in as I become. Part of what you're doing is choosing who you're going to grow into of the many people you could actually finally assemble, finally assemble right there standing in your own shoes. So let's get this thing working for us. Now, that means a bias toward action, i.e. join the dance, get out there and start doing stuff. So <clears throat> it's story time. So I'm not going to give you a couple of illustrations out of my own life. Um, and by the way, I've got more material than I think the time has because I've never given this talk this way. I have no idea how long it's going to last. We'll just see. Um, so let's talk about how to do the be, do, become, how to do this generative cycle really badly. You know, so out of my own life, I can talk about how, to, how not to do this at all, um, and then talk about a certain angle on this we might want to learn something about and make some sense out of the piece of paper that you found when you walked in. We'll get to that later. And then maybe one more story about doing it right. So literally, you know, wh why do I teach this course? Where did this thing really come from? This comes from the intense pain I experienced as a sophomore, a 19-year-old sophomore in 1973. Um, by the way, I'm 66, about to be 67. I got five adult kids, got eight grandkids. Anybody here got more than eight grandkids? I didn't think so. I win. Okay. The, um, so, like, I'm way old. I've had time to do a lot of things wrong. Um, and so I go to college, <clears throat> and um, I wanted to become a marine biologist. I wanted to follow Jacques Cousteau. I fell in love with Jacques Cousteau when I was a kid. 
watching the TV show. I love the TV show, The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau invented the aqualung. You may not have even known that. And I noticed he was doing this really cool work because he got to make movies swimming with seals. I go, cool, you can be paid to swim with a seal. I want that job. Um, <clears throat> and I noticed that he's getting old, and I go, oh, when Jacques dies, I will take over the Calypso. That's my life plan. That's the, that was his research, but I forgot to notice he had three sons, by the way, um, <clears throat> who were in line ahead of me and took over the work. But nonetheless, that was my plan. I didn't do any checking it out. I didn't do any of the kind of stuff I would recommend you do. I just made this thing up watching television and stuck with it for about the next 12 years. Um, I go to Stanford. <clears throat> I get in. They let me in. I go. Um, they have no marine biology program for undergraduates. Nobody even cares about that stuff. So, well, biology's in the name. Let's just major in biology. It's probably pretty similar. Not even close. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going along. <clears throat> and while I'm majoring in biology, um, I really don't like it at all. I'm not very good at it. Um, and in my, uh, the end of my sophomore year, <clears throat> one of my TAs, my lab TAs, comes to me and says, Dave, you know, we'd like to have a conversation with you. We notice um, you're not really enjoying the work, and by the way, you don't do it very well. Um, <clears throat> we have a recommendation. We would like to recommend you drop the major and do something else. The only thing you do well is argue for your grade. Somebody thought maybe you should be a lawyer. <clears throat> Please quit. How many of you had a TA literally say, please leave my department? Okay, it's a really affirming experience. Um, so, of course, I knew the guy was full of crap. I blew him off, stuck with it. You know, so now we go to the fall of my junior year. And at the end of that quarter, the same thing in the next slide. You know, Dave, in fact, I was talking to John, your TA, last quarter. We've gotten together. Really, we'd love it if you quit, Dave. Um, you suck at this. You're really bad, and you're argumentative, and you're annoying the other students. Please leave. We can't make you, but please leave. Um, so I'm just beginning to get the sense that maybe this isn't working. <laughs> and I'm thinking, maybe I should change my mind. Maybe I should do something different. And it suddenly occurs to me. I'm on scholarship. I'm on California State Scholarship. My family's broke. My father died when I was a kid. We have no money. Um, and I've got to get out in four years. Anybody here got that get out in four years thing? Kind of making a little nervous here. Yeah, welcome to Cal Poly. It's impossible. The, it's getting better, Stephen tells me. It's getting better. It used to be impossible. Um, but you can't even get the classes, right? So I got to get done. And there's no fifth year, stick around, do the intern thing. That's not going to work. I can't afford it. So I, uh, I, I suddenly realized on Thanksgiving break, right, in the fall quarter of my junior year at Stanford, I want to dump biology and change majors. Oh, my God, if I'm going to get some other degree, I probably get, got to get going. I have five quarters left to finish something that isn't biology. Um, and I have no idea what it is. So the day after Thanksgiving, Friday morning, I sit down with, then was a book rather than a website, um, called The Courses and Degrees, about that thick, and I started reading the description of every single one of the 64 majors, assuming one of them, just one of them is going to jump out and say, it's me, you know, I'm, I'm your purpose in life, uh, and you're going to love it, and then I'll jump to that, and I'll, and I'll get through it. And about three in the afternoon comes along, and I've read through the whole thing, nothing. Nothing jumps up and says, it's worth doing. I must have missed it. Do it again. So read them through again quickly. Second path, nothing. That's the technical term. The, um, <clears throat> pardon the French. And, and my mother, bless her heart, is in the kitchen, you know, and she goes, well, that even turn. She goes, I've always thought you'd make a good engineer. Just thought I'd mention that. Um, <clears throat> and of course, in my day, because I was an anti-war guy for, during the Vietnam era, I was like, you know, and no, engineers make me bomb and kill people, not going there. Um, a very broad-minded understanding of the field of engineering. And, <clears throat> and so I went back to the engineering school and started reading not the majors, but the classes. The cla I mean, maybe there's one class out of the 1,500 classes they teach us there. Maybe there's one worth taking. Just one. And I found one. ME 103, Introduction to Machines, where you got to make a cool thing. And I've been, you know, dis dismantling and not reassembling things in the garage for a long time. My mother was actually right. And well, that looks like it's kind of fun. Okay, I'll be a mechanical engineer. I don't even know what that means. Eight o'clock in the morning the next Monday, <clears throat> I come in to Wild Bill Reynolds' office, who is the chair of the mechanical engineering department, because I know I'm going to need help to get through this thing. And I said, Dr. Reynolds, my name is Dave Evans. I'm on scholarship. I got five quarters to go. I'm a bio major. Can you get me an Emmy degree by a year from June? <laughs> and he said, did you bring a transcript? As a matter of fact, I did. So I handed my transcript. 
It goes, okay. And he gets out the green quadrille pad that all engineers have handy at all times. And he opens the courses and degrees, and he puts his head down, and he's a bit off his floppy hair. He's a, he's a mathematician. And he starts writing. 45 minutes go by. 35 minutes into those 45, I go, um, Dr. I, I was down here. Dr. Reynolds. And he looks at me and goes, and he goes back. Then he looks at me and he goes, and, he, and he, he, he's, he's writing something, throws it away, writing something, and then he finally goes, he's got one, he goes, good, here. And I go, what's that? He goes, walk into the mechanical engineering department, I'm your major, take those classes, you get a degree, get out of my office. Um, so, <clears throat> I, mean, I got breath credit for, you know, basket weaving. I, was, I, I barely got, and then halfway through my um, senior year, I was taking advanced thermodynamics and freshman physics at the same time. Um, the prof would say things like, now you may recall from your early physics, I was like, we haven't covered that yet. Um, <laughs> it was horrible. This is an incredibly bad way to go to college. Okay, do not do this. Um, how many of you are already senior, juniors and seniors? First and second years? Okay, don't do this, okay? The, um, dear God, if nothing else happens, just don't do this. The, um, so, you know, then I'm almost done with my senior year, and Dr. Reynolds comes to me and says, by the way, please apply for the co-term master's degree, the fifth year getting a master's. I say, oh, gosh, Dr. Reynolds, I'm not really sure I want to do that. I can't really afford it. He says, I don't think you heard me. Apply for the master's degree. Well, you know, I really said, you're not listening. I've already secured funding for you. You haven't learned a damn thing. You've got to stay here another year. I won't give you a bachelor's unless you get the master's. Sign up. That's the deal. Do you understand? Got it. <clears throat> so I have a master's uh, <clears throat> in thermal sciences because it was required. I hated every minute of it. The, um, now, while I was working on the master's, I'm still trying to make some sense out of this thing. And then I'm walking through the student union, and I look up, and there's a news special. There's oil crisis. The OPEC, OPEC invented itself about this time. And there were hour-long lines of cars at the gas station where gas was a dollar. A dollar, my God. You know, <clears throat> Western capitalism will crash on that. So, um, and I went, oh, that's it. That's my purpose. I will solve the energy crisis. I found one. You know, like climate change. So, and I, and I, so I came out with a master's in thermal sciences. I was a designated Stanford advanced energy technologist in 1976. A little thing that was not in the brochure was, oh, by the way, nobody cares. You have now been carefully trained for an industry that will not exist for the next 35 years. So I spent four years trying to be an advanced energy te technologist in an advanced energy field that wasn't there. Very hard to go to a party that hasn't started. <clears throat> um, and I'll stop here because I'm running away every time. Um, <clears throat> then I got a phone call with a welding torch in my hand doing a little bit of labor on the side for some guys trying to do a startup in solar energy that failed, of course. Uh, but I'm re welding together a solar energy test rig, and a guy at Apple Computer calls and says, we'd like to talk to you. And he said, oh, you mean the Dave Evans at Hewlett Packard. Dave Evans is a very common white guy name. I'm the fourth, my son's the fifth, he's the sixth, so we just can't think of a new name. Um, you know, there were 4,000 Dave Evanses on AOL the first week it opened. I mean, you can get Dave Evanses in six packs at Costco any time you want. Um, <clears throat> and I'd been getting the other Dave Evanses mail for years. Said, so, no, no, you want the computer scientist guy at Hewlett Packard named Dave Evans, not me. And I hung up the phone. And they called back, no, no, we want to talk to you. I go, no, you don't. You don't want to talk to me. You're wrong. And by the way, I don't want to talk to you anyway because computers are so boring. So don't bother me. <laughs> you know. And by the way, this is not how to get a job. Um, <laughs> Apple then is now is so arrogant, if anybody hangs up as that's not you, they persisted until they finally forced me to having lunch with them. Fourteen conversations later, to their great surprise, they offered me a job, and to my astonishment, I took it. Because I had no interest in this technology. That's how I became the world's first mouse product manager in 1979. I had no interest in what they were doing at all, at the time. But they had a purpose, which is to make computing friendly. And maybe the person should be in charge, not the machine should be in charge. And that was happening. That was a happening thing. This energy thing was not happening. And I suddenly realized, you just got invited to get a front row seat on a bus going to a very cool destination that you don't want to go to with a bunch of smart people that are going to work really hard and try to change the world. Or you can stand on this corner all by yourself naked with a sandboard, sandwich sign on it going, stop killing the dinosaurs. You know, um, <clears throat> what do you want to do, Dave? You want to get nowhere on the thing you care about, or you want to get somewhere on the thing maybe you could learn your way into? And I said, try the bus. So purposefully, 
got me into a totally different place. And I learned over time ways of thinking that might be, and, and, and more happened and more happened and more, and then we go to this thing we're doing now. But, you know, if I had stuck to my purpose, nothing would have happened. To make something happen in the world, do you care? Are you any good at it? Is it even happening yet? Is there some way to get in? You've got to get a lot of things going at the same time to make a connection. And you might want to be a little adaptable. Now, one more thing. So the second story that will get us to this little thing we're going to do, very briefly, is another conversation. So I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people like you, and this one woman who is just about done reaching her passion goal, which is to become a um, public health policy developer, serving communities, moving healthcare from remediation of illness and pathology toward wellness. So she was an early wellness advocate and wanted to bring it into the public sector. Great, noble enterprise. And she was just about there being done with her MPH, her master's in public health, and she was doing an internship with the county and about to get the job that would allow her to do exactly what she'd been trying to do for 12 years. She's well into her 30s now. Been going to school forever. Comes from a poor family, had to work full time all the way through school. I go, it's, you know, it's, this is great. This is working fine. What, what are we talking about? She goes, well, I'm struggling. I go, well, Helen, what's the problem? Well, I, I'm finally doing what I really want to do. And I don't know, it's just not working for me. It doesn't feel like the other things I've done. I go, well, what else have you done? Well, I was an E911 dispatcher. I worked in a fire department, a police department. When you, somebody answers the phone, and you, you dial E911. I was the person on that phone. And before that, I was a Starbucks barista. I said, well, great. I mean, so you've been a Starbucks barista, you've been an E911 dispatcher, and I used to be a fireman, so I kind of know what that's like. Um, and you're now starting to be a policy wonk. If you're honest, which job did you love the most? I hate to tell you. Barista. Say more. Well, you know, what happened for me was, you know, it's such an anonymous world we live in now. I would learn my customers' names. I would see all the regulars, and I would memorize their favorite drink, and they would walk in and go, Hey, John, small soy latte, double pump with the caramel twist on top? Sure, the regular for you once again. And if I was really careful, when I would hand them their drink, frankly, I would turn it so that we would be holding the cup, maybe even touching hands a little bit briefly at the same time. So I went person to person, and I would see them smile, and I changed their day, and I love that. And I said, and when you're writing policy, you can't see anybody. He goes, actually, no, I can't. So it's not that you're doing the wrong work. It's the nature of the work we're doing. So we're trying to make an impact in the world, and it's not just what you care about. It's how you do it and who you do it with and where you do it. There's a lot more going on here than just what's the theme of my purpose which is what that little worksheet's about. So I'm going to give you a few minutes now. This is not going to solve your purpose problem. It's going to get into, let's get smart about this thing. So she was asking the question, where do I fit? And fit isn't just role, isn't just industry or, or topic. It's also location in the sense of a role. So is this really the contribution I want to make? Is this a good fit for me? And what is she really talking about? Well, back to our coherency model, she's talking about that what you do thing. What role in the world works for me situationally because the role you adopt in the world is the point where you can make an impact, which is where you're living purposefully or is meaningful to you. It's this impact point, which means it's time for us to do the impact map, or if you will, lay out the dance floor on which we get to dance in this pursuit of purpose and making a difference in the world. So I'm going to briefly describe to you what this is, and I want you to work on this thing a little bit. We're going to do this really fast. Make sure we still have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Now, <clears throat> the horizontal axis is the type of impact we might have in the world, of which I will generally say there are three kinds. Okay? I can do sustaining and supporting things. I can maintain what's running currently in the world. I can renew, repair, or remediate things. I can fix things that are broken or get rid of things that are bad. right? Or I can introduce new things to the world that weren't there before. So I can sort of sustain things, I can subtract things, or I can add things. And those are all fine, but they're different qualitatively. And they're sort of like, you know, gen these are not units. It's not like six points of newness versus minus two points of repair. It's just these are types of work. And I'll give you some illustrations. Now, on the vertical axis, there's the point of impact. 
Where specifically do I connect with the world? Am I connecting near or far from, if you will, myself? At the near level, it's the individual level. That's what Helen was really enjoying as, as a barista. At the far level, it's maybe at the global level. And in between, it could be you know, a small group. It could be an institution or a segment or all of California or the California State University system or national. You know, How big does it go? And she was about to go from the individual to an entire county. Wasn't a bad thing, just a very different thing. So when you put these together, the kind of work I do, the kind of impact I'm making, and the place I'm making it combine to generate the location of your impact. Not good or bad or impact, not big or small impact, just different. Examples. Okay, if I'm an investment banking systems analyst, what am I, I'm working in the medical industry, I'm the analyst for medicine at Goldman Sachs. Well, I'm not changing the way capital structures work. I'm not changing the capital market industry, but I'm running at an institutional level, the medical field, this thing. I'm some right there in the sustain level. I'm the Gates program malaria person. I'm getting rid of malaria for the entire planet. That's a remediation at the global level. I'm a brain surgeon, a very, very highly. Anybody want to go to med school? Any med school people here? You know, I want to be a brain surgeon, a highly trained, highly regarded person who you know, removes tumors one at a time, right? I'm just pulling, that not, I can't even be, I, I, I yet to know the ambidextrous brain surgeon who can do like two. Um, so it's still just a, a very remedial thing. You're not smarter after the brain tumor's out, you're barely back to where you started, so I'm just remediating one person at a time. I'm a homeless center chef where I feed maybe 50 people and train a couple of them how to feed themselves and maybe get a job in the food industry, so I'm, moving toward supporting them. I'm also remediating their hunger and moving them toward self-sustainability. It's a small group, the people in my, in my kitchen. You know, I'm the Google autonomous car person. Really new thing that's gonna change the world for many, not all people, because asphalt doesn't touch all 7.7 .7 billion of us yet. Um, but that's a new kind of thing. Or I'm Bill or Dave in frankly three roles. I'm like, now we have, as most jobs are, most jobs have more than one role. Uh, so I'm both, I'm both a teacher, and at Stanford, design thinking is kind of old hat, so you know, it's not that avant-garde a thing, it's kind of new. Uh, it's a small group called Stanford Students. Um, when we are speaking at conferences on education and training of the universities, we're very avant-garde, uh, very new, um, and that's working at the educational sector level. We've now trained over 150 universities to do what we're doing. We're getting published in, in research. That's kind of a big deal. And then when I do the author thing, you know, I mean, a book isn't that powerful a change agent thing. It can help, you know, but it's not the same as an in-person experience. But it's a lot of people. It's a half a million people, so it's many more. You know, in 13 years at Stanford, we've taught a couple of thousand Stanford students. And in three years, we've reached over half a million people in the book. So it's just a different math. So my job looks like that. That's my job. So now the question is for you. Take a second and do this worksheet. I want you to write down a couple of the roles you have had and at least one or two or three that you'd like to in the future. I have been, you know, think maybe if you have a summer internship, write that role down um, and write down, I would like to become, you know, this doctor, I'd like to become that kind of an engineer, I'd like to become a teacher, you know, think and about what roles you anticipate in the future you might want to give a try to. And then try to locate those roles on the map based on What's my point of impact? If I'm working in the school room with 30 kids, then that's a small group. That's part way up on the vertical, right? And I'm teaching them the new math. That's a little bit new. Teaching them ancient history, that's sustaining, right? So <clears throat> now where you put the dot is up to you, by the way. There's different narratives you could give for different roles, but how do you see it? How does it feel to you? And locate where those different roles are. Now, the key things here is there is no better or worse place on this map. The brain surgeon is not in a bad place, and the Google guy is in a good place because he's in the upper right. Um, there's anywhere on here is fine. There's no right answer. We don't observe that people have a particular, like, my good place is. You may have different roles all over the place. I wouldn't say that, you know, personalities or psychologies align with this per se. Helen, the woman who was struggling with her policy role, Ended up going that route and becoming a policy person very happily, but she had to change the way she thought about it. Okay? After you've got a couple of these down, then one of my favorite questions is just, what do you notice? When you look at your own map, what questions surface for you? 
like, oh, for some reason that quadrant's empty. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or um, everything seems to be clustering in one spot. Or, boy, this is all one-to-one. -one. It's all, I've, I've been doing incredibly one-on-one -on -one stuff most of my life, and that's most of what I envision. I wonder, if, how do I feel about that? Again, not good or bad, and we're not judging when we do these questions. We're just looking at noticing what's going on in your own life. That can start informing not just what is my purpose, but where could I even deliver on that in a meaningful way? I've got to find a place on the field to dance. Okay? Um, and now, if you will, I'll just give you a moment. Um, <clears throat> share what either insight or question this might be bringing up for you with that person you were talking with earlier. You know them a little bit, so I'll give you just each like a minute or two per person. What does this bring up for you? Okay, share that with your neighbor if you can. Okay, there's not enough time for you to get into that, but I want you at least sort of get warmed up, so maybe you'll take this conversation with you as you go. Um, and now I'm going to actually kind of skip through some stuff because as, you know, as I anticipated, I have way too much material for the time. Um, but the point being, <clears throat> the takeaways on this, by the way, is there's no right or wrong place. But as we're getting into this question of what impact do I want to have in the world, what's my purpose, we want to be thinking more deeply about that. And you really want to be able to get to know yourself well enough that this stuff is working for you. We find everybody that we work with really cares about their purpose, really cares about their impact, and they're not even sure what they mean by that. So start giving yourself a chance to succeed by even knowing what it is you're talking about. So on this generative cycle thing that I mentioned earlier, um, you'll notice that, you know, I didn't actually tell you how to do this yet. He says, wait a minute, you didn't really give us the tools to do this yet. Can you, can you operationalize this? And actually we can. We had asked to summarize the whole thing in like a sentence and we came up with the following. It's not a sentence, it's very sh four very short sentences. So how do you do the be, do, become thing? How do you turn that into this generative cycle, which really is what designing your life is about? Oh, well, you do it this way. You get curious, you talk to people, you try stuff, and you tell your story, which we would call the generative cycle, not the vicious cycle, where I'm going to get curious, particularly what do I get curious that I care about? What do I, am I curious about in the world that matters to me? I want to do that purposefully. Then go out and talk to people that are doing that and get their story long before you go get a master's in thermal sciences at Stanford for a year and a half and then suddenly realize it doesn't even work. Um, you know, then go try stuff, do things in the world with other people. And while you're learning, keep telling your story in an interesting way, which keeps the cycle going. But people go, well, well, gosh, now that I hear that about you, have you met this other person? Did you know this is going on? And you get this generative thing going on. <clears throat> you, what you're really doing is giving your curiosity a walk. You're taking your curiosity out behaviorally into the world and letting it find its friends. You keep that going purposefully until something engages you and just keep iterating that process. That's, in fact, what it means to design the worthwhile life, according to us. Now, that would lead me into story time, too, um, which I'll do the massively short version of, which is so let's update now all the way to how did I end up on this stage? I'll take about a five-minute story, do it in about two sentences. So back around 1990... Um, I had been doing high-tech stuff for years. I wasn't doing any of this kind of stuff necessarily, but I had been away from youth work for a long time. Uh, I, I've always, you know, been a YMCA counselor and coach Little League and that kind of stuff. I was mostly working with high school and college age people uh, for years. Got so busy for a while, I lost track of all that, then went back to it. And long story short, just started talking to some people, got invited to teach a class at Berkeley, which is bizarre. How that really worked, I thought it was going to happen once. The students liked it. We did it for eight years and 14 semesters. Then my buddy, I, and so I started telling that story. I got curious. I talked to a lot of people about what's going on with youth these days, and I got invited to teach a class by this one guy named Randy. And then I did that thing. I tried stuff. I just taught one class one time, one semester, and it surprisingly worked. Well, we did it again and did it again and did it 14 times in a row. At the end of that 14, then my buddy Bill gets a job at Stanford, and that's a lot shorter drive, frankly. Um, <coughs> that's really the reason for it. And we got together for lunch, which I thought would take a year, of talking about this weird thing called life design that I was sort of working up. You know, and he says, this is a great idea. Let's start it this fall. We'll prototype it this summer. I got to go. Thanks for having that great idea. Let's start right now. And bang, we start teaching at Stanford in 2008. So, you know, and then that thing went on, and the classes went going, and the kids liked it. They said, please write the book. I tried real hard not to write the book for two years because I thought it was a stupid idea. Um, 
<clears throat> and then we wrote the book and it surprisingly enough worked and people thought it was interesting. And then one thing began another. And 20 years ago, if you'd asked me, I'd be here talking about this because of the stuff that's going on. There's not a chance in the world that would be true. But I got curious. I talked to people. I tried some stuff. I kept telling my story. And if you keep doing that, sometimes things can happen. So <clears throat> you might be saying, but are you saying, Dave, just go out there and try stuff uh, and wait for a purpose to come and get us? Or are we supposed to have something in mind? No, 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 absolutely do go for it. Have something in mind and live purposefully in the way to try to get out there on that dance floor. At this point, I would have um, let you listen to Jane Chen's story, which is a really cool story, so look it up on the web. Um, <clears throat> The net of which is that Jane, like me, the second time around, you can do this. So the bottom line for this talk is, do want to live purposefully. Do care about something and get going. Do get started. Don't wait to know for sure you're doing the right thing. Don't demand of yourself you have to change the world. Don't wait necessarily for the world to make you rich, sexy, and famous all at the same time while having the meaning-making experience you want to do. Go get on the dance floor somewhere that you possibly can. Repeat, repeat, repeat. It's an iterative process. And go do the work. This is hard. It takes time, but that's okay because we're in it for the dance, not just for the destination, because the joy is living purposefully which really is just about go and live. All right, well, thanks for coming out. And, uh, and I, you know, my first question is, what is your purpose? But now I know I'm not supposed to ask that question. That's, right. not, that's not a good question, so we'll cross that one out. Um, but, <clears throat> uh, you know, this, this is a Veritas forum. Right. So a lot of your book doesn't directly deal with spirituality. So, you know, as you develop this whole thing, what right. role did your personal spirituality play in developing this very intricate system with right. lots of graphs and things? Um, the book actually doesn't not deal with spirituality. It just doesn't deal with it in um, the in-house jargon of the religious crap. Mm -hmm. um, so I've even written a paper called The Christian Companion to Designing Your Life, which is a 14-page white paper on the underlying doctrinal collaboration and compatibility between the gospel and designing your life. Um, but uh, my own story starts with when that sophomore was lost, you know, I, that was right at the beginning of my own faith experience. And I, first place I went was to the church and I found them useless. You know, um, they didn't help at all, but just made you feel guiltier. Um, because they say, well, what do you think you ought to do with your life, young man? I kind of go, oh, boy, I really, I really don't know. I really, well, what do you think God's will for your life is? I go, well, I, I, I don't really know. They go, well, have you prayed about that, son? Have you prayed about that? And I go, yes, I am. And, and they go, well, what have you, what have you heard, Dave? I kind of go, yeah, how's that hearing thing work? Anyway, what's that? I mean, do you get like a note or something? Um, um, and they would go, well, Dave, uh, if you feel far from God, uh, who, who moved? Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, th they were as unhelpful as the people in the career center, uh, but they just made you feel more morally guilty about it. Um, <laughs> so that was the beginning, and eventually I found my way, and I was sure that the Christians were holding out for some reason, that I knew that Christianity couldn't be a large and fairly viable worldview and be as bad at this as most people seem to be, which turns out to be true, the whole idea of vocational discernment, um, how does one find one's way, um, is a really big part, actually, of the Christian tradition. They just don't teach it very much. They do more than they used to. Um, so that is where I began. So designing your life is kind of Christian vocational discernment on design thinking. Okay. Um, well, uh, you know, as you go through it, so much of the book is this mix of career, personal life together. Right. Is, is your spiritual life underlying all that, or is it above it all, or how does it fit? Um, it, it, all, it fits in the fabric. It fits, it fits entirely in the fabric. Um, what I'm not doing is what I would call platonic dualism, where, you know, in, in, the, in the Greek tradition, as you all know, you know, um, spirituality or divinity or transcendency um, is over here, and materiality is over here, and they have nothing to do with each other. In fact, they're hierarchically organized, and spirit is more real, and material is less real and kind of crummy. Um, that's not a Christian understanding. A Christian understanding would be that the world is a great place that God thinks is really interesting, um, and is a deep part of everything, 
Um, and so rather than like I run over to my spiritual life and then I run back to my career, I'm trying to walk out what does it mean to be a co-participant in the reality we call God that is a part of everything we do always and everywhere, um, and then engage fully with that. So uh, for me, the, the walk of faith is a manner of living all the time. There are certain aspects that, I mean, part of life includes, you know, just like you get your, your car tuned up and you, you, you go in and get the oil changed, but most of the time you're driving it. I mean, so sometimes I pull away and like, you know, go to a retreat center and get my oil changed, but most of the time I'm driving the car. Hmm. I feel like this is like the Oprah part of the class, you know, where, <laughs> tell me about your, okay. Um, <laughs> now, as you, as you go through though, you, you know, especially when you're talking about moral compass yep. uh, and, and, and that area, um, well, so much of the book talks about how there's many possible lives yes. that could be meaningful, yep. purposeful for you. Don't get stuck on this is this is the only one. Is that also true of your moral compass or your being? Are there many possible moral mm. compasses that are equally of value, mm. or is there a hierarchy in, among them? If I have a roommate, for example, says right. my moral compass tells me maximize profit for myself. Right. That is a compass. Yep. Uh, is that is there no difference between the person who says my moral compass is I am going to live for the poor and the needy, or I'm going to live for Christ, or I'm going to right. live to enable the Buddhist teachings to right. play out in my life. Is there, how do you does think it that? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. matter. Yeah, it, t it totally matters. Um, I got him Dallas Willard, who was the chair of the philosophy department at USC for many years, died unfortunately too early in his 50s, uh, also was, was, a, was a deeply believing Quaker, wrote a lot on spiritual disciplines. Um, I heard him talking one time, and he was talking about how oh, there are all these different paths up the spiritual mountain. There's the you know the Taoist path and the Buddhist path and the Christian. And he said you know and, and you're a professor of comparative religion that you know those who say that all the religions um, are are just saying the same thing don't understand any of them. I mean whether or not they're pursuing a similar outcome or even the mystics talk about shared experience, uh, they are profoundly different. And living entirely for self. Um, aggrandizing experience and, and hedonism is entirely different than living in service to my fellow man. Even secular psychology in the field of positive psychology now will argue, will, will just re report the large majority of people who report the experience of a meaningful life um, are living oriented toward being in service to one another. Um, so it turns out serving one another and caring about something beyond yourself correlates highly now, I, and I think I would think that the reason that's true is because that's in fact how God made us. Um, so what's not true is that all world value systems are equal. I do think what is true, and I'm, I believe I'm obligated to think this as a Christian. Um, so uh, you know, I think God accepts God's decision to include free will as part of being human. So if God thinks you're capable of being responsible for setting your own path um, and the consequences attached there too, then I should probably accept that too. So if my roommate thought very differently from me in ways that I, I didn't regard, I would accept his or her permission to do that, their right to do that. That doesn't mean I affirm that it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So are you working on a designing your spiritual life sequel? We haven't asked about designing your afterlife, um, <laughs> which we're, we're not sure how that would go over, but the... Um, <laughs> I think the, uh, actually people are designing their spiritual lives around. I mean, so the, mm -hmm. I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, right? That's, that's the number one, that's the fastest growing religion in this country is I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Um, there are atheist churches all over the country springing up, um, you know, uh, and uh, around, hey, community and singing songs and hearing ennobling words that inspire me. You know, we like that too. Just forget that silly God stuff. Um, so I think um, a lot of people are moving into designing what they think they're going to do with their lives. Now, a buddy of mine, um, Scotty McLennan, who's written on this, um, is in favor of religion because, you know, for millennia, human beings have been trying to figure out how to live. And, hey, I think I'm just going to make this up from scratch. You know, the, the spiritual mountain is a difficult one to climb. And I know there are well-worn paths that people have given their lives for to try to make some sense of. But, no, I'd rather just take a machete and hack my way up from scratch. Um, and that's sort of like, I'll start on my own and make the whole thing up. Um, you could probably borrow from other people's wisdom. Mm. Uh, so this is a question from, from an audience member. 
uh, that I think will touch upon this because it says, what's the difference between dabbling and living the generative cycle? In other words, yeah. you know, why can't I just experience, in the, and sure. I'm going to turn to spirituality because right. I like that stuff. You know, you know, why don't I just dabble? I'll be a little Buddhist on Monday, a little Taoist on Tuesday, right. a little Christian on Wednesday. Right. How is that different from living a generative cycle? I think the difference is, is the difference between doing laps and being in a spiral. So if I'm, 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 I'm going around and trying a couple of things, whether it's a career thing, whether it's a spirituality thing, you know, a little of this, a little of that, a little of this, a little of this. Now, if I get to the end of that cycle, I'm just back where I started. Well, that was okay. I think we'll do pancakes again, you know, you know, mm -hmm. um, and let's go back around. Um, I had an incredibly bad idea in my 20s. You know, I really wanted, I was so busy in college, managing college so badly, as I already told you, um, I had no time to date. Um, and so when I graduated, I thought, oh, man, I, I, I'm only working 40 hours a week. I got all this time. I could actually date. I could actually, like, see women in person. Um, <clears throat> But I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get too involved, you know, so I can't take anybody out too often if they'll get the wrong idea. So I made a list of 10 women and I just dated in a circle. I dated one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and they all knew each other, by the way. The, um, <laughs> and like, what is Dave doing? So um, it was a terrible idea. But uh, so I just went around and around and around. And they all began to realize I'm just entertaining myself. He's not getting anywhere. Um, and so if you're just going around the lap, then you're simply kind of entertaining yourself. If I'm going to grow, I should be getting to some clarity. Mm -hmm. So if I try these things, what did I learn? What do I move into next? Am I moving toward some kind of coalescence into something that's cohesive and means something? Or am I just, you know, running all over Walmart having a good time? Yeah. Well, and, and this goes to a number of people are, seem to be asking, uh, how do I know when I've got to that clarity spot? Like, how do I know that, hey, I've experimented, and this is pretty good. It's good enough. Right. Let's stop, let's stop exploring. I think, well, okay, first of all, um, you know, and the last line in Luke, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So actually an unusual sentence. Um, that Jesus grew over time. In fact, Jesus even grew in God's, Jesus is supposed to be perfect theoretically. We, we say that often. Um, but over time, God liked him better. How does perfect get better? Well, perfect gets better if you have an organic model, not a mechanical model. An organic model would say, from the seed to the shoot to the bud to the fully blossomed rose, it's all perfect, but the fully blossomed rose is more rosy. It's more realized. It's more revealed. So no matter what convictions I come to, let's say I, I, I land on some worldview, I land on Christianity, I land on a Buddhist practice, you're not done. You make enough of a commitment to say, I'm now going to commit myself to implementing this and see where it takes me. Now, anyone in, on any serious path will tell you that that path continues. If you're going to have a practice that's sincere, it's going to make something of you. It's going to invite you to take another step, another step, and another step. Um, and so I don't think there's any version of done that works for very long. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm on about my fourth or fifth, depending on how you count, fourth or fifth conversion. I've become a Christian like four or five times mm. because the version of Christianity I had before ran out of gas. Mm. I was either going to lose it or it's gonna, either going to move on or move out. I'm going to go big or go home. And that's happened like four times. Well, so following up on that, you know, let's take your dating life again because yes. you are on Oprah. And, um, you know, yeah, one could argue your dabbling was yes. the thing that sabotaged you. Right. You weren't willing to make a commitment no. to one or two things. No, I just wanted to be entertained. You just wanted to be entertained. So how do you, how do you still balance this? Like, hey, I want to, yeah, I'm going to try a little bit barista and I'm right. going to, you know, be a policy wonk and I'm going to do this. Well, aren't you going to do none of them well? I do, okay, it depends what the question is. Let's say there's a period of my life when I would try a couple of things out. And what I'm looking for, I'm not looking for a life or a career. This thing just went down. Um, what I'm looking for is some feedback that says, is this it? Is this worth investing in more deeply? Mm -hmm. So it depends entirely on what question you're asking. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so like in the dating example for me, what happened was the question is, you know, how long can you just want to hang out with people? Mm -hmm. Do you want to have a relationship where you get more intimate? Do you want a relationship where you're talking about building a life together? Well, that doesn't happen doing this. Um, and, uh, and so the game changes. Um, I think people who, 
I think people can get stuck in dabbling a couple of ways. One is it's just busying and entertaining. Mm -hmm. It's distracting enough you never wake up. Um, or it's, it's so scary. It's scary because is this good enough? And at some point, you realize um, you can't know. There is no knowing beyond a shadow. There's no certainty that this is it. Um, and so that's why we argue in favor of this prototype model is set the bar low and clear it. I mean, find ways to take a little more step and a little more step and a little more step. There's very often a lot more small steps you can take that give you a discernment input than having to go for the big decision. Like, well, do I really want to get a master's degree or not? Whoa, I mean, go visit somebody, have a couple of cups of coffee, try a small project on the side. There are lots of ways I can experiment with things that aren't unduly costly. Mm -hmm. And if I'm listening into those things and I'm growing through those things and I'm reflecting on what they mean to me, I'll have more confidence to make bigger steps, bigger steps, and finally bigger steps. So how much of that is just slowing down and listening and being observant? Like, I'm not going to figure out my life tonight, nope. no matter how much I read your book. Right. Uh, and so slowing down, talking to people, letting it organic. Because I think there is a sort of this notion, probably driven by parents saying, yeah. You know, you better tell me by Christmas right. how you're going to pay me back for right. everything you've invested in me. Right. So it, it, is it just, hey, take time to listen? Right. Um, and take time isn't sit on the couch and just wait for it to fall on you, listen. Like, go live. I'm, I'm saying, I mean, look, I already told you, you don't have a neocortex fully baked until you're 27. That's like five years post-graduation for most of you. But what do I do in the meantime? Just wait for my brain to harden? I mean, you know, no. Um, Get out there and do, I mean, do what you have in mind. I mean, be self-supporting, get a job, maybe get a couple of jobs, do the gig economy if that works for you. Um, but move through it. You can be a self-supporting, generative person who's still learning their way forward. Um, uh, David Brooks called this 20 to 30 decade, the Odyssey years in, a, in an op-ed years ago. That's what we call our primary exercise, the Odyssey plan. Um, part of what you're doing is generatively growing yourself into the person who has the capacity to hear the insight that life will give you at the age you're ready to hear it. You know, you're growing the 30-year-old who's going to have a better idea. Give her or him a shot. That's part of what you're doing. So it, it, there's a lot of listening. There's a lot of paying attention and capturing the insight of what I'm growing into. Asking too big a question too soon. Is this it? Is this it? Is this it? It's like, are we there yet? In the back of the car, every five minutes, it's, like, it's not going to work. Mm. slow it down and live your way into this thing a step at a time. So we talked before about the, the monastic life. Yep. I, I spent a year living in monasteries. You spent a lot of time up in New Kamadali. Yep. Um, you know, and, and there they talk a lot about vocation and discernment yes. being an interactive process between a spiritual mentor yep. and, and you. How, how is that different from what you're calling for in everybody's life? Um, it's just it's one instance of exactly what we're calling for. So one thing we'll talk about is uh, we define, dis how do you do this lifelong? I mean, the one thing we all know we're going to do is keep making decisions about the future that hasn't been revealed yet. I'm, I'm 66 years old. I've got these eight grandkids. I'm still trying to decide what to do with the rest of my life. It keeps coming up. Um, so discernment, I would define as a decision made employing more than one form of knowing, not just cognitive knowing or evaluative knowing, but also emotional knowing and spiritual knowing and social knowing, so that we think the tools that go into that discernment process include, again, knowing who you are and your compass and that stuff. And then what are those practices, the spiritual and personal practices that keep you on your A game? What are the, who are the mentors in your life that can listen to you and speak into you and help you find your own wisdom? Virtually nobody can do this alone. You know, we, we hear and converse our way into our clarity. We don't just sit there and emote it out of nowhere. Um, and what's the community of people around whom I can be with that will support me in a way to help me find who it is that I am? When, when you take the Stanford class, you're in a group of six or nine students, you know, for two hours a week, for 10 weeks, you know, and, and they become a mirror to help you hear yourself think out loud. Uh, it's almost impossible to hear yourself by yourself. Um, so the kind of things that monks can do for one another or a spiritual director can do for you we think everybody needs to find a place where they can be heard and they can hear. Hmm. Now, a, a number of students sort of say, okay, I'm getting a sense of who I am, what I want. Right. But what they're, what they're asking is, sometimes the world doesn't conform. Right. I want to work 20 hours a week. 
but I also want he- health care. Right. And I want to, you know, be able be able to one day, mm-hmm. you know, have actually a car. Sure. Um, <laughs> so those, and not as a residence. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And, and, and so, you know, maybe the world doesn't. Maybe I set as a life value to travel. Right. But I also set as a life value to be near to my family. Right. What do you do when, you know, you honestly look at yourself and you have things that either the world right. can't provide or are contradictory to each other? Right. Um, that fits in a whole category of what we call anchor problems. Okay. They're anchor problems and they're gravity problems. Um, and they're different. They're both places people get stuck for a long time. So a gravity problem is... Um, is gravity a problem? So I'm a cyclist, you know, I didn't put on the freshman 15 when I was a freshman, but I did put on the 60 year old 10 when I became 60. Um, and so now my bike is going much slower now that I weigh 10 or 15 pounds more than I'm supposed to. It's really pissing me off. Um, and so I've got, hey, Stephen, I got this problem. It's called gravity. It's really slowing down. Can you help me with this gravity problem? And the answer is no, I can't because gravity isn't a problem. It's just a thing. So when something is a circumstance, it's not a problem because it's inactionable. So as a designer, we would say, if it's not actionable, it's not a problem, it's a circumstance, the only thing you can do with it is accept it, and then try to design around what actually is actionable. So let's say, okay, I can't find a job at 20 hours a week that pays me enough to live the lifestyle I want or to get the insurance. I'm like, okay, that doesn't, that doesn't exist in the current economy, then that's maybe something you'd like, but doesn't exist. And the answer to that is, I'm sorry. Um, so um, which 40-hour a week job did you want? You, got to, you can't have it both ways. We had a student some years back who decided, you know, this whole capitalism thing is crap. I'm not doing this. Um, and I've decided I'm going to live really simply. I'm going to live radically simply. In fact, I've decided I'm only going to own what I can carry around all the time. And I'm, I'm only going to finish my major because I think it's crap too. Um, is to make my parents happy. They work really hard for this. It matters to them. I'm just going to do it as an homage to parents. Then I'm out of here. Um, and he did it. And he, he got down to 15 pounds of stuff. He carried it with him 24 hours a day. He started learning how to sleep in trees and parks so he could live on about six to $7,000 a year. Um, so he would just do a little bit of you know, skilled labor or unskilled labor here and there to keep things. He was incredibly cheap to operate. Um, and so he simply made the cohesive and the coherent decision to, I'm going to live radically simply, and in so doing, I'm going to step out of all these systems that I don't believe in. Now, if you're willing to pay the cost, that's fine. So the truth is, um, if you're, you can't have this, that, and the other thing, you simply get to decide which one you want to let go. Hmm. Um, which is very freeing, by the way. Yeah. But then, is there a way to discern between, hey, I'm going to value radical simplicity, and that's the only thing that matters, and I'll live on somebody else's lawn, versus, hey, I want to be able to give to many, many people. Right. And so this means I'm going to have to have a job that kind of allows me to take time off or whatever. I mean, how do you think through, though, are both those goals equally valid? If I actually believe in your autonomy, which, Mm -hmm. again, my faith obligates me that I do, you know, I really do think you're up to deciding what your life is about. Mm-hmm. So could simply living the instantiation of an incredibly simple lifestyle be as noble as, you know, working for the purpose of, you know, empowering a whole bunch of social change through donation and nonprofit work or what have you? Um, you know, it depends on who's doing that. I mean, I was hung out with these monks who retreated from the active world decades ago and through one lens, haven't gotten a darn thing to show for what they've done. And they would argue they've lived a life where they took their soul and they put it into a profound intimacy with the presence of the reality of God. And in so doing, connected to the entire world through their prayer lives as a sacrifice of concern and are one of the most deeply involved in the world persons alive today. Those are completely different narratives. And you can decide whether or not you think that has merit or not. Uh, and now how do you, let's say you're torn between some pretty dramatically different ways of being alive. I would suggest you can prototype anything. You can prototype living like a monk. You can prototype making enough money and giving it away for, I'm going to go make like 5,000 bucks and give it all away and just see how that feels. Mm-hmm. You know, try these things out and ask myself the question, 
what's more coherent? What is it, what's the honest way of aligning who am I, what do I believe, and what am I doing? Can I be that kind of a person in the world? And there might be more than one version of you, and then you just got to pick, because if, 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 at least show up. Um, so there's a number of questions of, of people asking specifically about Christian backing for some of this stuff. Okay. And and Christian the, backing. Okay. Support for some of this. So I mean, Jesus had a goal in mind that was to die for our sins. Where do you see him dancing, to use your metaphor? Where where do you see mm -hmm. him encouraging the dance versus a goal? Okay. Um, by the way, whether or not Jesus consciously thought he came in order to die for our sins is a very arguable thing theologically. Mm -hmm. And Anselm's little bit of work on substitutionary atonement around 1100 was the beginning of that idea, which is not my favorite way of looking at the atonement. So I'll just stop that right there because he can get in a lot of trouble. But um, the point being, what was Jesus about? Well, first of all, it's interesting to notice. Um, let's go to the wedding at Cana. So Jesus turning water into wine. Remember, whether you know One anything of my about favorite stories. Huh? One of my yeah, so, so water turns into wine. His first public ministry story, and there's this bizarre interaction between he and his mother. Um, and his mother comes to him and says, they've run out of wine. Jesus says, woman, my time has not yet come. Implying that he thinks his mother is implying maybe you ought to do something about the, the fact that the wine has run out. Um, and then she says to the servants, well, do whatever he says. Then he says, go get those urns and fill them up with water, and then you know how the rest of the story goes, assuming you buy the story. Now, what's really interesting about that is apparently at the time, Jesus is kind of softly, you know, invited by his mother to consider doing something special about this wine problem. He says, it's not today. And three minutes later, it is today. Now, we could get into a whole long Bible study, but what's going on there? I would argue that what happened there is... When Jesus said, my time has not yet come, that was his conviction. He really didn't think it was coming out day today. When he got up that day and put on the clean tunic because I'm going to the wedding party, you know, today's not the day. During the party, today's not the day. When mom actually comes up to him toward the latter part of the reception, today's not the day. Then she goes, oh, well, whatever. Now, by the way, Kim, she gave him an out. Do whatever he says. He says, look, here's 20 bucks. Go down to 7-Eleven, pick up a couple of beers. What do you want from me? I mean, there's a lot of mm -hmm. ways out of this story without filling up urns and doing this wild thing. Um, and yet he changes. That looks to me like real-time discernment. It turns out that Jesus grew into a guy that could hear the invitation, which was a bank shot off of his mother from God, that maybe today is the day. So I see Jesus as a very real-time person who's growing into the reality of himself. And the whole story is what we're invited to follow. Um, and then he's rather reticent. He's rather unpublic about scary things for most of his public ministry. You know, and then he says, I tur he turned his face toward Jerusalem and he went down there and then he'd get in a bunch of trouble and confronted power directly and got himself killed. Um, but so what was Jesus doing? I think Jesus would say in John 5, 19, <clears throat> I do only that which the Father shows me. So I think Jesus is actually doing exactly what I'm borrowing from, living purposefully into what is it I'm called to be doing today? And even he grows into that, you know, the way I understand the gospel, it's not like, here's this guy from the age of 12, kind of, you know, I got to die in about 20 years, 19 years, I'm just waiting this thing out. You know, because wait until I blow that rock off the tomb, everybody's going to think that's really cool. That's Superman Jesus. That's not the mm -hmm. gospel Jesus. Hmm. There's so many good questions here, but we, we need to wrap up in a couple of minutes. But uh, here's one that I, that I like a lot. Um, when is a dream too big, and when is a dream too small? Boy, when is a dream too big or too small? Well, let me answer this sideways. Um, one of my older sisters who runs the Graduate School of Education at Fresno Pacific um, and deals with a lot of people moving into teaching is that this noble profession, and a lot of them moving into teaching as a, as a second career. Um, and, and they have a certain picture in their mind about how it's supposed to come out. And she advises them, be very careful if you set your life goal as being something that only other people can decide you have. Because you put yourself at great risk. And I think what came out of that for me was, 
I think our goals or our hopes or our dreams can be stacked. I'm a big fan of stacked dreams. So when I started this thing at Stanford, when Bill said, hey, let's do this thing, I thought, you know, maybe this is going to go. Um, I had a six-level objective stack. Level one is, if we're lucky, we might even affect a couple of kids' lives here. Who knows? That's level one. Level two, maybe we do that well enough that enough students say this was kind of interesting, that the word gets out that this is the kind of thing Stanford ought to be offering us. I mean, the university ought to be helping you not just learn stuff, but figure out life stuff, what we call life, you know, wayfinding. Um, and that should, be, that should be something we do. So I know from a couple of students to student culture at Stanford. And then if student culture at Stanford expects this, level three would be the administration notices and goes, hey, what are you guys doing over there? Maybe that's an okay thing we should support. And then level four would be not only the administration thinks that's interesting, but we do it well enough that other colleges kind of go, well, hey, what are you doing? Maybe you could help us do that too. And now this starts to become an educational reform. And then actually that gets out into the populace at large and people around the world start saying, you know, maybe we're asking stupid questions like, what are you going to do with that anthro major, which is a totally stupid question. Um, and we stop thinking about young adulthood in these incredibly retrograde ways. And we've helped a couple of kids at Stanford and change that culture and move the administration and started doing educational reform and then changed the meta narrative of young adulthood in the, in the society at large. And in so doing, empower a bunch of lives to stop being upset about the wrong thing and get upset about the right thing. Now, um, when I started, if you hit level one, it's a good day. And we're actually now kind of at level, like about level four, which I never believed would have happened. So my recommendation about too big or too small, I don't think either. Break it up. If you're dreaming about something, bring it all the way down to the ground where you've got a good shot at actually getting the ball through the uprights. Super Bowl yesterday, you know, and, and, and have that change the world thing, too, because who knows, you might actually get a shot at it. Um, and give yourself a shot at, you know, the little thing, the bigger thing, the way bigger thing, and who knows the amazing thing. Um, but if you're stuck on only one of those along the way, your chances of success are way too small. So give yourself, enough, give yourself some options. Hmm. Let me I'll take prerogative on the last question. Um, yeah, you obviously love graphs. You love, you know, quadrants. Yes. All that's a, you, you've got an engineer's mind. Where does the idea of God works in mysterious ways fit? Well, that's where we get back. So if discernment is decision-making supported by more than one form of knowing, mm -hmm. and the reason we support people developing personal practices for these affective forms of knowing, emotional knowing and bodily knowing and social knowing and spiritual knowing, these other forms then that don't show up on an Excel spreadsheet or a graph. Um, and how do you get your hands on those things? How do you articulate those things? Um, so where that all fits, I think probably the, the simplest way to say it, it fits in story. It fits in narrative. Uh, we do a lot of work on storytelling. That's why the, you know, get curious, talk to people, try stuff, tell your story. Um, and so what, what would the story of your life sound like? Um, there's an old adage that God sometimes comes to us disguised as our lives. Um, well, if that's true, if God is sneaking up on you disguised as your life, are you listening to the story of your life well enough to know what the message is? So I think for me, uh, it has to do with listening into the story. What's, what's the heart of the story and where are you in it? And do you have practices that support that? Yeah. Uh, in, your daily, in your daily life? Or? Yeah. I mean, most of my practices hail from you know, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the antiquity of the Christian tradition. You know, um, I realized I was so bad at this stuff. Um, once I realized that um, Christianity wasn't just a bunch of answers to um, good, bad questions. The, 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 I spent about six minutes a year thinking about stuff that's right versus wrong or good versus bad. Virtually never comes up. And it's simple when it does. I spend the overwhelming majority of my time on good versus good, on light gray versus a little less light gray. Um, and that's all discernment space. Yeah, so in the discernment space, you know, how do you figure this stuff out? How do you hear what the truth really means to you? I realized I was so bad at that. I went back, so I went back to seminary. So I went back to seminary, got a graduate diploma in contemplative spirituality, which simply is a big multi-syllabic way of saying learning how to pray, learning how to listen to your life. Um, so I think people need to work, and so I have a series of things I do um, that, uh, that help me try to tap into the story of what, what life and God is saying to me at any point in time.